Hi there, my name is Richard and today I'm going to be reviewing the Namiki Emperor Goldfish from my own personal collection. So, here we have the box as it would arrive normally. Now, of course I have already opened this, I do use this pen, but I do want to show you what it would look like if it was the unboxing. This is a softwood Polonia box which the Namikis come in. And inside the box there is the name of the pen and the artist's signature here. And then you have the instruction leaflet with the uh, rather important instructions on how to maintain it. And then here's the pen. So, cleaning cloth. Uh, this is an eyedropper pen, we'll talk more about that later. The eyedropper's in here, the name card of the artist. My Japanese friends inform me Seiki Chida is about the right pronunciation, so I apologize if I get that wrong. Um, it's actually a beautiful name card, it has some lovely um, texture to it, it's a really nice piece of work, as you'd expect at this price point. Here's the pen itself, it's a bottle of Namiki black ink and of course here we have the goldfish which uh, we'll get into in quite a lot more detail in a moment so there it is in all its glory so that's how it looks when it comes in the box so let's have a look in more detail at it now so here is the pen itself this is a Namiki pen here's their mark it's by Seiki Chida Seiki Chida is a very famous Makie master in Japan, um, responsible for some very limited editions such as the Emperor Kingfisher, Dunhill the Miki, uh, the Tabernata, the Rising Dragon, um, some pens which, you know, this may be a very expensive pen, this is not a limited edition pen, so this pen is still created each year for the moment, the Miki occasionally retire their models, um, but any of those other pens I just mentioned come in batches of 25 or 50, very, very, very low numbers, very, very, very high prices in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and way up from there for some of the older models. So this is, the context is that this pen is a production pen that you can buy today. It's not particularly easy to get hold of, but it is available for sale. So now let's have a look at the pen and how it works. And then a bit later we'll get into the artwork on it and how it costs so much. So the pen is a Namiki Emperor model. It's huge. Um, here is a Platinum Preppy for size comparison, which is a regular size pen. It absolutely dwarfs it. So, this particular version of the Emperor, there's, there's alternates. There's rounded versions that look a bit more like this. So this is a, also a Namiki size 50. Same size pen. If I take them apart, you'll see they're pretty much identical in terms of the nib and the only difference really is there's a rounded top versus a flat top which this serves as a more useful canvas for the art so sometimes you see emperors with rounded tops sometimes with flat tops in this case it's a flat top um, while we're on this comparison other than that you almost the same pen the nib size is the same there's rhodium plating on the Mount Fuji emblem on the emperor and on the 50 Urushi, there isn't. But in terms of writability and usability, this is already the full experience. And it's a fabulous pen in its own right. It's one of my favorites. Um, I love it for work because although it's massive, it's black and it's fairly discreet. So in a little more detail, what we have here is a highly decorated barrel um, a massive, massive nib. There's Urushi on the feed. It's huge. It's, it's a number 50 Namiki nib. Um, it's about the largest production size nib in the world. There are larger nibs. There's a Denitrio 75, but these larger ones tend to be very limited custom models. So this is probably the largest nib that is regularly produced, um, uh, and which means it certainly has that quality to it, it's not an experimental model, they've made you know, thousands and thousands of this nib and it writes beautifully, a very wet line, uh, but very well controlled, and 
a natural bit of bounce to the writing thanks to just the sheer size of it. It's not a flex nib. You would be insane to use this as a flex nib, but it, it does give a little bit of bounce, a little bit of line variation, and we'll have a look at that a bit later. So let's discuss the filling mechanism. The pen comes with an eyedropper. So eyedropper pens, quite simple. You open the top and you squeeze the ink and it goes into the barrel. The barrel has a massive capacity for ink. You can write for several days, which is really nice. You don't have to change every few hours if you're doing intensive writing. And the pen has a valve at the bottom, so you probably can't even see the valve line. When I start unscrewing it, it'll merge. So the valve controls whether the ink is able to reach the front of the pen. So with the valve closed, there is a seal about here, which means that the pen will just write with the ink in the feed and here up until it runs out, then it will go dry. Opening the valve allows the ink in the middle of the pen to flow down. The valve, in principle, if you have it very widely open, it allows more weight of ink to push down, puts some more pressure. In theory, that should be increasing the wetness, increasing the flow. In practice, this is already a very wet writer for me. This is a medium nib. Um, but it's a wet medium, it's a very controlled, but uh, beautiful for sheen because it lays down a lot of ink, it doesn't, it doesn't smear it, it's, it's really pleasant. And the nib has a lot of natural bounce to it for being so large, so it creates line variation just through that. It's not a flex pen, please do not ever use it as a flex pen, but it, it does allow you to have that little variation, that little bit of softness to it versus a smaller Namiki nib, which is um, a very smooth experience, but a slightly harder experience. So uh, really it's an incredibly pleasant writing experience. So let's look a little at how this thing writes. So first things first, release the valve a little bit. So this is a Namiki. Emperor Goldfish. It is filled with Iro Shizuku Shinkai and it's a medium nib. So let me just show you some of the characteristics. Um, I think the most interesting thing to start with is that you have to see how far away the tip of your finger is from the end of the page. So if you're used to writing sort of down here with a pen and very finely controlling with your fingers how it writes, this is a very different experience. This is much more gestures. So the line is wonderful, very wet. You can see immediately it's, it, it's come out very wet, very smooth. So let's do Sphinx of Black Quartz, Judge My Vow, which is my favorite pangram. Let's have a look at the line variation available. If I go very light, sort of there, if I put a little bit on it here, and then quite easily you can see how much more ink is going down there with a medium nib, just with a little, little bit of pressure, not much at all. So that's the writing, pardon my handwriting quality. Um, it's really, really, really pleasant to write with. It's, it's very nice, it's very comfortable. It's much lighter than it looks, it just sits nicely if you've got a large hand. Um, it's, it's really good. And just to show off the point about how the grip makes a big difference, here is a regular size Namiki. This is a Chinkinmatsu, which is the pine, which is a lovely pen in its own right, with a normal size nib. And just see how close my fingers are to the page as I write. So this, this isn't ink right now, but you know, the control is, you know, it's a couple of centimeters away. It's very close, it's you know, quite easy to form letters, very easy to control with my fingertips. 
if that's the way you've learned to write. You switch to this pen, and you know it's the control is much more hand and wrist. So you know you spend many hours learning how to rewrite minimum. Because <laughs> if you try and write it with your fingertips, it's hard to do. <laughs> exactly, complete mess. Um, favors favors larger gestures. And I love the, you know, the, the F's and the G's and the just na natural things that arise from, you know, pound sign, etc. Natural things that arise from having a large pen and hand and wrist movements. So let's move on to the big question of how come this pen costs seven times, eight times as much as this very expensive pen with an identical writing experience and a thousand times or more the price of this Platinum Preppy, and if you gave me office printer paper to work with, I'd probably choose the Preppy every time. So why does it cost so much? How come this thing is hard to get hold of? Why would there be a waiting list at that price for this pen? So let's look at the artwork to begin with, then I'll talk through how it works. So if I just rotate the pen slowly, it's three goldfish in a pond. The goldfish are rendered with scales, they're rendered with um, metallic scales and very translucent tails. You can see at the top of the water here there is the ripples at the top of the pond. At the bottom here there is uh, the bed of the pond with bits of gold inlaid at the bottom and various bits of pond weed. It is incredibly 3D. So if I put it here where it's in focus and just rotate the pen around The maquillage technique used involves lots of raised maquillage, which is where they put layer upon layer upon layer, mixed in with various things, and it has a physical 3D form and touch to it. So if I run my finger over this part here, I can feel these lines. These lines stand out. The goldfish eye stands out. The reason it looks very 3D is because in some respects it is 3D. The goldfish eye here, the same again. The goldfish here texture here, texture. There's texture all over this pen. This The weed here, again, texture. You feel it. This part here, it's raised. This is not a flat pen. This is not a flat painting. So the art and skill of this form of painting maquillage onto pens um, is incredibly high. Only a very, very, very few people in Japan can do this uh, to a very good level. And to the level this pen is, it's, you know, the, these people who can do it this way, it's like celebrity status of the pen world. It really is um, astonishingly artistic and requires huge amounts of time. So the price is a combination of several factors, one of which is the sheer price of the materials that have gone into this. So the Urushi, the Japanese Urushi lacquer from which it is largely made is an ebonite pen body, but all of the surface on top is Urushi lacquer mixed with various things and decorations. The Urushi lacquer is harvested in very small volumes. Um, it's a very poisonous substance when it comes out of sap. And then from this Urushi lacquer, they combine it, they treat it to create the layers that go onto here. They combine different layers of different materials with different powders with different substances. They put charcoal into it, they polish it many, many times over. This pen that might look from a computer screen or a phone screen as if it is just painted with some paint is the accumulation of many, 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 many different layers of lacquer um, easily into the, into the 20s, 50s and 70s and, and, and way up for some of the most elaborate pens. So it takes a lot of time to do this. Um, one layer might take the artist hours and hours and hours to do one particular part of it, then it puts the pen away and the pen has to dry. Now, uh, Urushi dries in like a humid cabinet, um, it hardens in the humid condition, it doesn't, it doesn't actually dry in what we would think of as a dry condition. So it hardens in this humid environment, then when it's ready they put the next few layers on, they do the polishing, and they have to return to the pen time and time and time again throughout several months in order to create this. So what you're 
really getting is one of the most skilled pensmen in the world spending days of their time spread out over several long months, probably six months or more for the really elaborate pens. Um, and these guys are, you know, famous, famous pen artisans. Um, Seki Chida, when he's not making Emperor Goldfish, is making Dunhill and Miki collaborations, which are absolutely every single one of which is a auction collector's item. Um, hugely elaborate, and some of the oldest and the most valuable pens, you're talking million dollar pens. So these are fabulous things and it takes a lot of a very 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 good artist's time to make this it's not something that someone else can replicate it's not something that someone else can copy so what you're paying for is a incredibly skilled person to spend a lot of their time over many months working away with hand using absolutely traditional methods the whole way through and pouring care attention and incredible detail into this and that's the reason that they're very limited. So although it's not a limited edition, it's not number one of 100, it is very limited in number. There are not many of these pens made. There cannot be many of these pens made because there are so few people who can make them. This particular pen, there's one person who makes it and that person does not spend their whole time making this pen. So all this leads to the next question. Can it possibly be worth it? Well, if you're in it for the writing experience, then I mean, objectively, no, because objectively, you get the same writing experience from this pen, which is a fabulous writing experience. It is a multi-thousand dollar writing experience. It genuinely is. But you don't need to spend this much on this pen to get that experience. So it's worth it to you if you want a collectible piece of art by a really renowned artisan, which quite possibly you could keep for 20 years and sell at auction at a higher price. It's, it genuinely is a piece of art. Um, so I'm told that the, the crafters really appreciate it when people write with these pens. A lot of people buy these pens and immediately put them in a cabinet under a display light and never ink them once. And for me, when I bought this pen, um, that's not who I wanted to be. If I, if I was going to spend this money on a pen, it's because I want to use this pen and get the value out of this pen by, by just being admiring this pen every time I use it. Now, I have to say, it's quite distracting because when I'm trying to do some work with this pen, it's so, so beautiful in real life that you can quite easily become mesmerized by it. So I'm not actually sure it's that productive for me to use. And I certainly wouldn't use this pen at work. For work, I use the, the black Namiki 50 Urushi, um, which is, as I said, the same experience, but people don't really register it's an oversized fountain pen when you have large hands and because it's black it doesn't sh it doesn't scream look at me. So I think that about wraps up this video. Um, I wanted to post this video because I really appreciate the high quality pen videos on some of the other things I've bought and they have influenced my purchasing decisions and made me much more knowledgeable about things so I, I really appreciate what's out there and I wanted to reciprocate by posting this pen because this pen is one I, I can see for sale but I can't see reviewed well on the internet. So this was, this was my endeavor to pay back the favor by posting something which I hope people will appreciate and, and learn a little bit about. And I look forward to posting some videos of my other pens as well in the future. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.